Hello, everybody. We're going to be um, kicking off in one minute. Okay, welcome to everyone's Morgan. Welcome everyone to Morgan Hunt's discussion on artificial intelligence in the public sector. My name is Fraser Young. I'm the senior director at Morgan Hunt, responsible for IT business across the UK. I'm delighted to be joined by Albert King and Dr. Keegan McBride. Dr. Keegan McBride is an expert on topics such as digital government, digital innovation, the use of AI in the public sector, and digital well-being and happiness. Keegan is an active member of the academic community participating in several high-level digital government focus conferences and publishing in the leading peer-reviewed digital government focus journals. In his research, he aims to develop an understanding about the future, direction of the state and digital age by exploring the complex relationships between technology, society and the state. Albert King is Chief Data Officer at NHS National Services Scotland. Um, NHS NSS serves as a data hub for the health and social care community in Scotland. Through an unrivaled mix of health and social care data sets, professional capability and its leading technology platform, NHS NSS supports the development of insights with partners including Public Health Scotland, health boards, local and national government. Previously, Albert served as Chief Data Officer in the Scottish Government and draws on over 20 years experience in industry and public sector data and technology. Albert is actively involved with the Alan Turing Institute and has given talks on the AI in the past. So, Welcome everybody. If you have any questions you'd like to put to Albert or Keegan, please put the post in the chat function of YouTube at any point. We'll try to spend 15 minutes or so on questions at the end of the conversation. Okay, so I'd like to put the first question out. Um, the first topic we're going to run over is applications and trust. So I'll put the first question out. How is artificial intelligence currently being applied in the public sector and what are some notable examples of its impact? Yeah, so shall I, shall I start us off? Um, yeah, that'd be great. Yeah, go for so it. So I, I guess, um, you know, if I think about the way I see AI being adopted in the public sector, I kind of maybe think about it, um, I, you know, it, 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 it's pervasive, right? So I try and I try and think about it in, in a number of ways. And, and the first is really around automation and administration, right? So all of that sort of um, mundane activity that we have to do that, you um, uh, is really nevertheless very, very important, but which is an opportunity to kind of augment that, that capacity within our workforce to automate more and to create more efficiency. Um, and some of that can actually be pretty low hanging fruit, just about accelerating productivity. And you kind of see that coming through an awful lot actually in, in services like Copilot and they're starting, AI is starting to be embedded in, in the tools that we use every day, right? Um, I guess the, the second set of things that I kind of see is um, rearrange what I would just kind of describe as, as bracket as knowledge and intelligence. So um, how do we identify risk as a good example? You know, so there's a lot that we do in the public sector that is about actually managing risk. It's about identifying maybe individuals who are vulnerable or making sure that public services are, are high quality. So there's a lot I think that AI can do in that space or indeed to, to help us do things like, you know, anticipate demand and, and plan capacity and deploy our, our kind of workforce and resources kind of efficiently. And then, and then the third thing, and, and, and often I think what people kind of leap to when they, they think about the adoption of AI in the public sector is in this sort of direct kind of service delivery, which I guess for me in, in the health service kind of means things like um, kind of diagnostics and treatment. Um, and, you know, there's some great examples there where, um, you know, radiology, for example, is a, uh, you know, involves um, often 
two very specialist humans, uh, radiologists, very, very scarce resources as well in the health service, both looking at a bit of imaging from a, you know, a high end complex piece of imaging equipment. Um, because, you know, those, uh, we need, we need that double check. And, and a lot of that can be done by, by AI. And that can yield things like a 45% saving in, in, in that capacity that's, that's there. Um, or you see things like AI being deployed in the health service to, to scan case notes. And there's a great example there where, um, actually not far from, from where I am today in, in BARTS, um, they were able to scan tens of millions of patient records and identify people who were at risk um, of diabetes and thereby avoid um, leg and foot amputations. So there's lots, I think, that can be done uh, in that service delivery piece. But we also need to pay attention to those sometimes less glamorous, you know, automation intelligence and, and knowledge and intelligence applications. Yeah, I mean, I think I think about AI in the public sector somewhat similarly in the sense that you sort of, yeah, you see, you see both internally and externally focused applications of AI. So internally, I'm thinking about things that are sort of internal processes for managing the public sector. Uh, there's going to be, you know, one example people talk about is if you are having lots of meetings and you have a requirement to uh, release reports or release minutes of meetings, you now start to see AI being used to sort of create transcripts and summarize these documents and release them automatically. There's lots of things related to, you know, document management, information management, fraud detection, uh, going over lots of sort of uh, digital documentation and things like that happening sort of behind the scenes. This is one way that you see AI being used quite a lot. And there's plenty of examples sort of across uh, the world at this point related to this. The Then you have the externally focused applications, which are going to be things that are sort of focused more on, you know, service delivery and citizens and service users. So uh, this is where you'll see lots of people talking about chatbots, but of course there's much more to AI than chatbots, but this would fall within this category. Uh, Estonia has a program where they're using sort of satellite imagery to detect whether or not uh, farmers have uh, mowed fields or grasslands that they have to. And instead of having to send out a physical inspector, this is just being done using sort of AI and image recognition. You know, lots of things related to real-time transcription and subtitles and, uh, you know, cool things. And of course, there's also this, you know, not just fully replacing people or fully automating things, but you have... Uh, AI or machine learning being used to create variables that can be fed into existing IT systems like business rules engines, uh, as an example, or Copilot as well, these sort of like intelligence augmentation tools. So lots of things happening. You know, there's sort of dozens, if not hundreds of examples of how AI is being used across the public sector, especially in Europe, but obviously much further than that as well. Good. Right, great. Um, can you talk me through the technical foundations needed for AI inside the public sector? So I guess um, in, in truth, so I'm a data person, right? So the first thing I'm going to say is that what you need is really, really good data. Mm. Um, and uh, I don't apologize for that. And, and so I think the fundamental foundation that we need is a data infrastructure that enables us to um, understand where our data assets are and to understand the quality of those data assets and the lineage of those data assets, because all of those are, I guess, really foundational, and not just actually in a sort of technical sense to being able to create and deploy, um, you know, uh, AI-based um, solutions and services, but also because those things enable us to understand and mitigate for a number of the risks that people often think about, such as, um, uh, so you know, such as biases and, and whatnot, where we don't. So we really need to understand things like, you know, what. What populations does the, do these data cover, and what quality of the data is if they just as they describe populations and, and and services? So I think I think for me that's the the key and 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 frankly most important foundational step. I think there's then a set of things around how we kind of assure and manage AI. So you know AI often is a technology which can be deployed in a way that it continues to to kind of learn, and so the way we do that kind of model management and that model ops piece and you know do that sort of ongoing model assurance process requires a certain degree of yeah technical infrastructure and capability that kind of wraps around that um i suppose my final my final comment phrase would be that you know to a degree um actually for some of the things that we were talking about a moment ago things like um you know worker augmentation and productivity you know driving productivity those things actually will come embedded in the commodity tools, the technology tools that we're that we're deploying 
um, kind of already, you know, in in three six five. And there's there's the thing that I think is really interesting about that is the extent to which that's not an ex often not an explicit adoption of AI. It's quite implicit and can be yeah. quite can be quite subtle. And organisations, I think, are going to need to be alert to that in future. Good. No, I mean, for my side, it's the same sort of things that. Uh... If you're just going to buy something off the shelf, it's going to be a bit easier. I mean, there's lots of interest at the moment in, I don't know, ChatGPT and these other sorts of AI solutions. Theoretically, you can just buy this off the shelf and use it. Of course, it's much more complicated that in the public sector. Yeah. But if we're talking about building things in-house, if we're talking about being able to fully leverage AI or machine learning or some other component of a you know broader digital transformation, mm -hmm. you absolutely have to start with the foundations and the fundamentals. If you're still doing things on paper, if your entire sort of backend is yeah. you know, running on Excel, you're there. There are steps that you can take to prepare yourself to be able to work with AI, right? Yes. Um, you need to have your ETLs in place. You need to have the proper infrastructure. You need to understand how it works. You need to be able to, you know, uh, make the investments required to make sure this is sustainable as well. Because yeah. uh, AI, especially if you're trying to train something in house or something like that, also requires a lot of resources. So, do you have not only, you know, do you have the funding to build it today and use it? But what happens five years down the line? Are you able to sort of keep it up to date? How do you manage this technical debt? How do you manage the sort of legacy systems as these things, you know, evolve? And and similarly, if you're going to be procuring or or buying in a lot of these AI-based systems, how do you manage the sort of differing requirements? How do you try to make sure you don't end up with this tangled mess of, you know, different providers, different infrastructure, different foundations uh, that just become increasingly hard to to manage over time. Uh, so that it's it's really important, to, at least in my mind, to be a bit strategic in how you're thinking about this, uh, mm -hmm. and making sure you really have the strong foundations in place first. Uh, absolutely, things like version control are going to play a huge part in this as well, uh, which I think is often overlooked. Yeah, and and just to pick up on something you say, Keegan, I think there's an interesting point there, isn't there? About and to a degree, this isn't just about AI. It, it's true of um, I suppose modern digital solutions more generally about. Um, organizations having a really strategic view of their technical architecture so that they can think carefully about how they integrate um you know solutions that are you know often SaaS solutions that are coming um that they need to integrate within into their sort of digital ecosystem and um you know that that does need a sort of yeah a very strategic approach to how you manage that kind of process and that technical architecture so I think that's a yeah a really good really good point that I should have yeah, thanks for picking so, up. To, just, just to continue on this, because I think it, I think this is interesting as well. Like, if we're talking about AI, the real value from this is sort of, um, it's not going to come from data data held within a single agency or organization. Oftentimes, you're going to be able to, or, or rather, need to combine different data sources to create different sorts of um, uh, variables and factors and, and whatever else. You need to be able to interact and exchange data. It's important to have sort of, you know, have the the you know, interoperability and data exchange methods in place so that you're able to fully sorts of access data from where, uh, you know, from these different organizations. Because if you're doing this in a super narrow way and you're only relying on the data that you have in-house, if you're not a very large organization, the sort of long-term value uh, may not be as great as it could be if you're able to combine data sets from different sources, uh, you know, that this data is kept up to date uh, in sufficient quality, uh, and quantity and, you know, so on and so forth. Good. That's really good points you made there. Um, what are the primary benefits of using AI in the public sector and how does it contribute to better governance and service delivery? Maybe I'll start off with this one and then, then hand off to Albert. I think that the, absolutely there are benefits here related to sort of uh, efficiency and effectiveness. Uh, you know, you can have cost savings, you can have, uh, sort of reduced uh, workload, you can uh, improve service delivery and service satisfaction for citizens, but there's a lot that needs to happen for this to take place. Uh, so I want to avoid this sort of idea that, you know, AI is some sort of cure-all and can fix a lot of these things. It's like a nice to have, it's an add-on. Uh, and if you're already engaging in digitalization, if you're already trying to uh, provide services in a more innovative digital format, if you're already experimenting with sort of digital transformation informally, then adding AI on top of this could sort of enhance these benefits. But on its own, uh, you know, it won't be as large. Of course, if you uh, work for an IT agency within the government and now you're using uh, Copilot and you're able to code more efficiently, you will perhaps see productivity gains. You might have decreased costs. You might be more effective and efficient. But 
the potential benefits will be much higher if you're able to sort of incorporate this within, you know, this broader sort of transformative strategy, if that makes sense. But I'd be keen to hear other thoughts and feedback. Yeah, no, I have to say I agree, Keegan. I think one of the biggest challenges that I see organizations facing, um, not just in the health service, but, you know, thinking about my, my sort of previous roles and, and kind of background in the public sector is, and, and this absolutely does predate, you know, um, the current enthusiasm and excitement around AI, is that transition to kind of digital business models and how do we how, how do we make that transition culturally in terms of our processes and, and how we um, deliver services? Um, and those then need to be enabled by the right to sort of digital solutions, some of which might be AI driven, right? Because, um, you know, like you say, AI um, isn't magic. And despite all the hype just now, um, we can't just sprinkle some AI dust on things and then uh, services are going to magically get better. So that that um, that transformation needs to be really thoughtful and um, uh, you know, I think has the potential to be disruptive to the way people think about how they add value in service delivery. And so you need to bring the workforce along with you and that's a cultural thing. And so you need to really think through and pay attention to all these factors. Um, and that's where I suppose potentially the big, really big, really big strategic gains can be. And we just need to kind of do that in a kind of incremental fashion. At the same time, you know, I agree that there are, there are things we can do um, maybe more quickly in that productivity space. Um, through those commodity tools. And I do think as well, actually, um, as I said earlier, in the public sector, um, a lot of what we do is about managing risk. And, and that's actually, turns out, is already a very data-driven activity. You know, it's an information-driven activity. And so I think there are, there are a lot of opportunities in that space to help us better manage risk, to de-risk public services, to identify perhaps where there are risks and, and deploy our resources more intelligently. And so, and so that maybe does feel like um, a space where we can uh, make some make some 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 really good and and solid early gains. I think. Good. So thanks for that. And um, how can our governments ensure fair access to AI-driven services and benefits for all citizens, including those in underserved communities? Shall I shall I start us off? Um, uh, uh, and uh, I'll, I'll, I'll try and I'll try and answer that question, Fraser. But I suppose my, my caution in doing so is that word "ensure" because I think this is this is tricky, right? And um, we can we can approach this from a number of directions. Um, you know, first of all, I think it's really important that, as I was saying earlier, the data that we use to create um, AI-driven kind of models or, or public services, we make sure that, that data is um, you know properly representative of populations that we consider. Um, biases within that data um, and that we uh, are creative and thoughtful about how we involve those who are affected by decisions um, that uh, AI driven solutions might might uh, might make or, or support how they're involved in the process of developing those models and algorithms and that they can kind of feed into that in a kind of co-design way and there's actually there's a really nice piece of work that um, uh, was done under Scotland's AI strategy that, uh, that was launched I think in, in March this year um, the Scottish AI Register, which which um, is is all about doing that and, and empowering public bodies to 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 do exactly that. So I would encourage folks um, to have a look at that. I think the other part of it for me is um, essentially around having access to um, digital services and the skills and confidence to know and to be confident about how to interact with digital services, as well as you know fundamentals like connectivity. And um, I suppose what I've seen really effective in that space is the Connecting Scotland program where you know they are trying to bring together um as I say not just the connectivity but try and make sure that folks across the population have um confidence in how to access digital public services whether they're AI powered or not. Um, and I think you know a key challenge for that uh, for that program in the future is to make we're going to help people to understand how um AI might be involved in making decisions about them and 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 sort of you know I very, very strongly feel that um, the more people understand about this technology, the less fearful we're going to be about it, and the more confident we're going to be in our adoption. Very good. Uh, I mean, from my side, I think my colleagues at the Oxford Internet Institute have done quite a lot of work on this. For example, uh, the use of counterfactual explanations as a as a method for improving sort of awareness of how algorithms make decisions. Uh, there's also risks about. So, so my colleagues they had a, a paper or an article in Wired. That was basically titled healthcare bias is dangerous, but so are fairness algorithms. And they look at how even though medical systems like an AI based medical sort of 
systems can be uh, biased or disadvantageous for people of color or for other sort of disadvantaged communities. Sometimes people try to fix this using some sort of fairness algorithm, but in doing so actually end up making outcomes worse. Mm -hmm. So it's very hard. We of course want to strive for fair, equitable usage of AI. Nobody's going to tell you that we should build AI based systems that you know are discriminatory by default. Uh, I think that's not what we're trying to do, but we have to be very, very careful in how we go about trying to fix some of these things. Because if you do want to you know, have AI systems that are effective and fair, it's not as easy as just putting them through some sort of algorithm uh, or it's, it, it's much more complicated than that basically is what I'm trying to say. Uh, there's oftentimes a little bit oversimplification, I think, in, in terms of, you know, oh, if only we involve people from the start, we could have sort of better AI systems. Or if only we use this algorithm to sort of make these more fair, then we can cut back on all of these different sorts of things. But it's it's not that simple. And there are many steps involved. And you can address these from everything from how you're procuring the systems to what data you're using, uh, to having sort of documentation so that you understand why certain decisions were made. Uh, and the other part of this is that AI systems can actually empower people as well. It's not only discriminatory, yeah. uh, particularly those from underserved communities. So I've done a lot of research on this idea of proactive services, which is where you're, instead of sort of really waiting for the citizens to come to you saying, let's say I needed unemployment assistance or welfare assistance, something like this, you have the data in your database. So you see when some sort of event happens and then you can start delivering services proactively. Uh, and what this does is sort of empower communities who maybe don't have access to the internet or they don't understand how these services work or where to look for these sorts of things. Using AI in you know, combination with a bunch of other sort of digital tools, you can actually say, hey, you're eligible for this now, here you go. So it's it's not only thinking about from the, from the get-go that, okay, these groups of people are going to be uh, excluded and we you know, should need to make sure to do everything that we can to include them, but it's about thinking from the start, like how can we make sure this is like, you know, being used to sort of bring these people up uh, and, you know, push back against these. So it's a really wordy answer. Um, <laughs> and, and I probably misspoke somewhere in there. No, no, but, no um, that was yeah. definitely, it was a lot of detail. And um, so we'll move on to the sort of next subject of ethics and trust. Um, how can governments build and maintain public trust in AI-driven decision-making processes, particularly in critical areas such as healthcare, law, and public services? Yeah, so I mean, I guess um, th there's a, well, there's a bit of a risk phrase that I kind of rehearse some of what I've already said because yeah. I think the first thing is to make sure populations uh, understand what what AI is and and indeed is not. Um, you know, AI is a, a kind of set of data driven technologies, and yeah. and actually the definition of, of what that set is in that set is is kind of slightly slightly variable and, and debated occasionally, but, you know, broadly speaking, things that kind of mimic human intelligence um, in, in some way, shape or form. Um, but I guess um, fundamentally, yeah, it's a set of data-driven technologies. It's not magic, as we were saying. People, yeah. I think if they understand that, I think um, it takes away some of the fear and, and picking up on something Keegan said, I think um, ultimately uh, these tools can empower citizens as much as anything else, right? And, and actually enable greater transparency about how decisions are arrived at than we've we've ever actually had i mean i'm not sure if i'm being you know if you think about the way we make decisions today um often uh, a decision we made by essentially by a human or by human beings who might be looking at some guidelines but ultimately they're making a decision and they're quite capable of rationalizing that decision um and th there's no there's no real way of examining how they've arrived at, at that decision you can't um, look inside somebody's head and, and look at the algorithm that's actually been applied and how they've arrived at that rationalization. So I think I think there's a set of opportunities there then, therefore, to be um, exceptionally transparent in how we go about making decisions, right? And that's one one aspect of this for me, um, based on the foundation of, of understanding what these technologies are. Um, and uh, whilst I recognise what Keegan was saying about there is no silver bullet to um, uh, child, you know, to, to involving um, the public and those who are affected by decisions. I do think being as transparent and open about the way in which we develop these and the way in which we've deployed AI and the role of AI in decision making is pretty fundamental as well. And I think that's why um, you see things like Scotland's AI register being created and adopted. And I think, you know, there's been similar initiatives in places like in Kelsinki and 
uh, in places in the Netherlands. And I think these are really, really valuable tools in that space. Yeah, I, I just want to pick up on that just to, to make sure that, that I'm clear on what I mentioned in the last thing. It's, I absolutely agree with you. I think things like model cards, I think things like algorithmic registers, these are all really important steps. People should be able to look at and understand which sort of uh, algorithms are being used to make decisions about them and more or less understand you know which data is being used, the sort of algorithmic methods behind it. Uh, and I think there's a lot of interesting research coming out about the sort of applicability and benefits that might come from uh, these sorts of, uh, yeah, model cards, but also what Helsinki is doing, what Amsterdam is doing related to these algorithmic registers is also uh, quite cool. In terms of how do we ensure fairness and belief in all these sorts of things, this is, and this is going to be my sort of message throughout the entire discussion here, which is that this is much bigger than just AI, uh, because AI is part of a broader digitalization uh, type initiative. So it's not only how do we trust how decisions are being made about me specifically related to AI, but how is the government using my data? So we need things like consent management. We need to understand, uh, you know, who has my data, who's looking at it. Uh, Estonia, for example, you can look at uh, data that you have within the population register and who's querying it uh, and what time. And if you don't understand why it's being used, you can write to them to say, hey, what's up? Why was my data being used? And they have to reply by law. So it's, it's about you know, thinking it, it is this sort of systems and holistic approach and trying to build from the beginning uh, the technological foundations to ensure transparency throughout this process. This covers everything from how do we procure algorithmic systems to what does our data infrastructure look like to how are we handling uh, yeah, consent management, my data, these sorts of things through to how, you know, how is my data being used by this model to make decisions about me? Uh, you know, why was this done instead of X? This is where the sort of counterfactual explanations come in. Uh, it, it it's a whole process and, and it's very, you know, systemic in, in, in nature. And, and also just to sort of, as a final point, oftentimes you hear this idea of like algorithmic black boxes and they can't explain it because it's just too complicated. This is also not true. I mean, of course, models and AI systems are complex, but the idea that you don't know which data you're using or what sort of model that you have used to sort of train these systems, you can and you should have sort of requirements related to auditability and transparency. And these are things that can be enforced uh, you know, with better procurement or, or sort of through governmental regulations. And there's a lot of really interesting research happening in this space. It's yeah, I think it's really, really interesting, Keegan, and just picking up on something you were saying there, I guess the um, that work in, in Scottish government around the AI register, as I said, driven by the AI strategy, but also very deeply uh, connected with the Scottish government's open government um, programs. You know, and so that whole um, kind of ethos around um, open government, open data, and um, sort of lifting the veil, if you like, on on government and the way um, it's making decisions and um, uh, and the way it's um, delivering services and, and so forth. Um, what I think is really interesting is that if you follow that through, I think the um, there's 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 a risk that citizens simply become overwhelmed by the amount of information. So there's an interesting question there about how we help citizens to navigate that and. I suppose what I was trying to say earlier is that there's something about how the education system builds those citizens of the future, um, that people have their, their critical thinking skills and knowledge, but also maybe a, about how we, um, oddly enough, actually apply digital and data and AI to help people navigate that, that you know, and uh, to see the, the to, to make sure that they they have visibility of things that might concern them or that they might want to be more actively engaged with. Um, but can have some trust that there's some, there's some agents that are dealing with all, all the other stuff for them and just keeping an eye on it. So, um, yeah, I think it's a, a really interesting um, point that you make, yeah. Good. Right, I think you, actually, you guys actually answered quite a lot of those questions I was about to ask, so we'll move on to workforce and skills. What are the key skills and competencies that public sector employees need to effectively work with AI technologies and how can governments facilitate their development? So I'm happy to sort of kick this off and then, then pass it over. But I think one thing that we are starting to see is that when it comes to human resources and sort of staffing the public sector, the sort of core competencies are changing. So there's a really great program uh, on teaching public service in a digital age, which is an open access syllabus. And they have eight sort of core competencies that they see as being necessary for the public servant of, you know, in digital government. And it's about, you know, like being able to work agilely and understanding sort of the potential benefits and harms of data um, and, and a few others. Happy to put a link in the chat, but it's, you know, I think fundamentally 
the, the skill set required to work in the public service is changing as it becomes increasingly datafied uh, and digitalized. The, you know, being able to understand sort of statistics at a basic level, being able to work with numbers, being able to understand these digital technologies is, is absolutely becoming, uh, you know, important. The other part of this is that there needs to be sort of, uh, you know, like learning and educational opportunities to, to boost confidence and capacity on these. So uh, related to AI specifically, you have um, out of Finland, uh, Elements of AI, which is a free course that you can take that sort of introduces you to the uh, fundamentals of, of artificial intelligence and how it works. And, you know, just being able to sort of understand, uh, you know, even at a fairly rudimentary level, how this stuff works is, is really important because it's going to be increasingly sort of integrated into the public sector over the next, uh, you know, decades and, and probably for much longer. Um, the idea that you can work in the public sector and not understand technology will just it, it, it's not going to be feasible. Uh, it's already increasingly less feasible, but but still possible. But 10, 20 years, you know, this is going to be a sort of core skill set, I think. Yeah. Well, I think from my view, you're 100% right. Um, how can governments address the potential job displacement caused by AI adoption in the public sector? And what strategies can be implemented to reskill and upskill the existing workforce? I, I will pick this one up. As well, if you don't mind, I just have one sentence, which is that I don't necessarily think that AI can be disruptive, but I also think that the hype that is being given to how much it will disrupt the labor market is probably overblown. I think that you will see some disruption, but uh, there's a lot of interesting research that shows, you know, workers are going to become more productive. Uh, so the idea that you have these workers who are becoming more productive and then before you need less of them, it just, it, it, I, I'm not sure that will happen. Uh, but that's also not, I would say, a sort of canon position on this. Uh, so I think it's important to think about it. But yeah. Yeah, no, I agree. It's very, very important to think about this stuff. And I think, you know, that's that's partly because we're actually we're all crystal ball gazing, right? And we none of us know the future, um, despite all this magical AI we have around us. And um mm -hmm but also partly because um, people might not actually be concerned. So we need to be able to um, support uh, people in these conversations. But I think um, I'm probably in the same place as Keegan. That when I do look into my crystal ball, I see a future in which, um, I guess, really scarce resources. You know, I mean, I was talking earlier about radiologists. The reason that's exciting, that that development, that, initial, that you know, those kind of developments I was talking about earlier is because we don't have enough of these people. We don't have enough of these skills. And that's true across the workforce. We don't have a lack of things to do. We have, um, so so this is all about augmentation, isn't it? It's about um, uh, taking away perhaps sometimes some of the mundane, I hope. Um, it's about augmenting human beings with machines that can make them more productive. Um, and uh, ultimately, therefore, giving us more capacity to actually deliver excellent public services and better outcomes to people. So, um, you know, I, I have a pretty optimistic view about this as, as well. And I suppose this this really links back to the, the previous conversation and, and what Keegan was saying about how important it is that in the workforce, we don't just have those, you know, data engineering and data science and, and AI skills, but that people really, really understand how to use these technologies and how to work with them and alongside them um and how to bring some of that um how to interpret how these you know how, how to interpret the, the sort of information that they're seeing from ai models um and the kind of critical thinking skills the numeracy the awareness of data and and how to interpret it i think are, are really pretty foundational um if you haven't seen it actually there's some in the context of gener generative ai there's some really nice guidance that the uh, i think anyway that the cabinet office has produced around you know being careful and thoughtful about how you use um, particularly those public um, kind of facing models, you know, think about information leakage, think critically about what it's telling you, understand that, um, you know, you can't 100% trust this stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the reason I think it's nice is that it's just set out in a really accessible and straightforward way. And I think the more of that alongside the kind of, um, kind of material Keegan was talking about, the more of that we can provide people, the more we can help them navigate this really, really fast moving space, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, just, you know, to pick this up exactly as you say, right, at the moment, there tends to be in, in, in many countries a sort of 
crisis in, in the staffing of the public sector in the sense that maybe there's not enough people or not enough experts who are able to deal with some of these problems. Uh, but what you see with AI is this sort of, especially if we're talking about some of the emerging LLMs, is that they're empowering, right? Maybe you don't understand how to work with tool X, but now that you're able to sort of augment your ability uh, with some sort of uh, you know new foundation model that's emerging, you're actually able to sort of uh, empower people uh, to move higher up into the workforce. And there's also a lot of re really interesting research that shows that sort of those who are at a lower level in the workforce are, I don't know, more empowered than those who are higher up. Of course, there's a lot of importance, um, you know, like specialists are able to sort of use uh, ChatGPT better than the than, than non-specialists, but there's also this component to it, which is that we potentially unlock more access to sort of workers as AI continues to to evolve, which means that the specialists can go on to focus on things that they're currently not able to, and it, it, lots of interesting stuff that's going to happen. Of course, the other answer to this is that um, if you make cutting costs and you know shrinking the public sector your end goal, uh, absolutely AI can be a way to do that. Uh, but that's not necessarily the right way to go about it. Good. Um, and we've got a few questions coming through. So we'll ask this will be the last one in this slot before we go to the questions that have come through. What partnerships and collaborations can public sector agencies establish with educational institutions and industry to bridge the AI gap in the government workforce? So I, I, I can start off if, if you like, Keegan. So I guess um, what I've seen work very well um, uh, is thing, uh, things like, um, well, particularly in Scotland, uh, are things like the data-driven innovation uh, program that the University of Edinburgh and uh, other universities in Southeast Scotland are, are running. Um, I think that creates an awful lot of opportunities for just exactly as you're saying, Fraser, for whether it's kind of skills transfer or trying to think about kind of um, you know, new new algorithms or bring expertise in to solve challenging problems or or actually get advice um, from people on the kinds of issues we've been discussing today. You know that. That has been a, a really impressive initiative and it is delivering an awful lot in terms of skills delivery and all that kind of good stuff. And you should also, um, you know, a, a way into that is through the Data Lab, which is Scotland's National um, Data and AI Institute. So you know, that's the place to go and to start your journey, I think, in terms of discovering how you can um, tap into, um, I think, what is a really rich data ecosystem within Scotland. No, I would just follow up and say that I think absolutely there's a, a there are many good opportunities to to work with academia in this, uh, and that uh, what academia is very good at is looking at these sort of complex problems within the public sector, and trying to sort of feedback, come up with ideas, and then you know sort of not necessarily do the implementation, but at least help understand the problems, provide the sort of new insight, uh, and go from there. Good. Right, so we'll go on to the questions. First one, um, do you are you worried about like some Skynet in the Terminator future? Uh, just very briefly, no, it's not going to happen. And <laughs> I think no, 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 I mean seriously, I think uh, it, it's it's very weird because in the UK we have the upcoming you know AI regulation summit, uh, which will be in the first couple of days of November, and there is a lot of interest. Uh, related to the sort of extinction related to AI and all these other sorts of things. Okay. I think it's completely overhyped. Uh, and it, if anything, it's, it's, it's more of a marketing because, you know, if you convince the world that you've built this thing that can destroy humanity, everybody starts talking about it. And that's what we actually are seeing now, of course, mm -hmm. uh, even though generative AI, of course, it's more advanced now, but, you know, I was doing research on generative interfaces almost, you know, five, 10 years ago. Yeah. Uh, it's been used in architecture. So, so fundamentally it's not that new, um, but it's, we, we will see, maybe we get there, but at least at the moment, it's not something that's at the top of my, <laughs> you know, list of concerns. Good. Yeah, we need it. Well, I would like to see a sequel. Yeah, <laughs> a good one. Um, right, so the, is there a difference in data intelligence tools and AI? If so, what are the core differences? Um, so I'll, I'll maybe start. Um, I mean, I guess, so what I think is really interesting is that, um, that in marketing terms, I've often seen things that span, and this is why I use this term data-driven technologies, that, that span actually pretty traditional sort of data science and analytical techniques through to pretty uh, pretty flash kind of um, uh, I don't know, machine learning and, and, and neural networks all being branded as AI. So on one level, 
I think it's a bit of a spectrum, really, of data-driven technologies. But as I was saying earlier, I think the thing that tends to differentiate AI is that ability to kind of mimic some aspect of human behavior or human thought. Um, and I think, it's, so therefore, it's maybe more about um, the behaviors that you see from the technologies than it is about um, being sort of too hung up on the, the, the nature of the specific, I don't know, algorithms or technologies that are, that are driving those behaviors. Um, and uh, I think that's probably the differentiator when, it, when, it, when you boil it down. What do you think, Keegan? So there's this sort of quote that always goes around, which is when you're fundraising, it's AI, when you're hiring, it's ML, and when you're implementing, it's linear regression. I think that still sort of holds true. Um, to be honest, if you look at the definitions of AI, you will find a new one. Basically, anywhere you turn, the OECD has a definition, the EU AI Act has a definition, the UK White Paper on Regulating AI has a different definition, the National Standards Board in the US has their own definition. Uh, not only that, but what we're talking about today is AI and questioning whether or not it counts as AI. Uh, 20 years ago, absolutely would have been considered AI, so it's a moving benchmark. Uh, it, the answer is basically it depends. Um, and whether or not you're selling or buying something and who's doing it, it it's it's uh, today, right? Linear regression and fairly simple statistics actually will solve most AI-based problems that you have. Like the idea that you need some sort of neural network to do something within the public sector at the moment, or that you're using some sort of uh, deep learning, there's probably some use cases for it, but the really low hanging fruit and, and sort of, you know, a majority of the problems, that's not relevant. You absolutely don't need to be thinking about that. Uh, but yeah, at least that's, that's how I think about this. Good. Um, another question, should you adopt an AI partner for the board trust, for a board of trust or on a case per case basis to gain the maximum value and benefit? So I'm not sure I fully understand the question, but I suppose it, the way I understand that question is, um, you know, are you looking for like one um, sort of AI partner um, to sort of uh, tackle all of your kind of AI challenges or what have you? Um, or are you, or should you be thinking about sort of individual kind of solutions and, and specialists or, or individual applications? Um, and I think, so very much a personal view, I think this links back to the conversation we had earlier about a technical architecture, right? So you need a strategic technical architecture that enables you to integrate um, not just AI, but digital solutions into your kind of digital business ecosystem. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, I, I think most organizations are going to be procuring solutions that have AI built into them rather than developing and deploying models themselves. Yeah. Um, and so in that context, I think, uh, you know, you're, we're going to all need to face into the challenge of how we integrate those, as I say, across our kind of digital business ecosystem. Um, so I don't think it's like a single uh, kind of AI specialist supplier to, to rule them all. I think it is, you know, individual best of breed solutions in a particular niche expertise, whether it's, um, you know, um, identifying heart arrhythmias using uh, your mobile phone in your pocket, or um, there was one I came across yesterday, which was just awesome, which was looking at cow fertility um, by using AI to look at, uh, at bull semen. So there you go. <laughs> didn't, you, didn't you were going to learn about that today, did you, Fraser? No, I did not. <laughs> Good. Uh, just also like to say that Albert's finished up 10, he'll be finished up at 10 too. He's got, he's born in a room, so I think he's been chased out. So as um, how do you approach sensible education about AI for a wider use, user community across a large organization, such as a university, when the community are listening more to media and vendor hype? So I think the most important thing that you can do is just allow people to talk with each other and create these opportunities for discussion. Uh, if people aren't talking with each other, you sort of get stuck into these, these silos. But if you have, uh, you know, if you have training programs, if you have these educational opportunities, uh, and then you combine this with bringing together sort of interested folks to have conversations with each other to hear about what's fact, what's fiction, um, actually doing myth busting, I think is a huge need for this at the moment in the AI space, because there is so much mis and disinformation out there. Um, so th these are the biggest things. The, what I have seen successful in the past as well is uh, sort of these doing these deep data dives. So what we used to do is talk with public sector organizations, understand what data that they had, and, and sort of go through these ideation seminars as well as like what's possible, what's not possible, but having sort of experts from industry and academia in the room as well. So it's, you know, the public sector sort of officials or 
you know, it, 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 at other large organization, they tend to be the domain experts uh, of that thing, right? If you work in healthcare, if you work in social welfare, you will know that very well, but you might not necessarily know what's possible with AI or with data at the moment. So by bringing in experts who do know what's possible and then, you know, combining this with your expertise in, in you know, the sort of domain area and providing this opportunity for, for conversation and discussion, it can go a long way. Right. Um, we're about to start discovery of new CRM um, with MI. How do we ensure we harness the opportunity to review our business processes and data needs to ensure that we are data ready to maximize the potential of AI? So I guess um, uh, if, I, if I start off, so I suppose the first thing is um, if you're, if you're genuinely thinking about um, you know redefining your business models, I would, the important thing is to take a step back and ask what's the way to what the best way to deliver this kind of process or business or service. Um, now that I have access to you know, a whole range of kind of digital tools and not be too beholden to the way you happen to have done it in the past because it was you know administratively efficient because that was you know we had we had access to um, the kind of tools that we had in the past, including actually those that we maybe think about as digital like much loved excel and, and email and all that kind of stuff right so the first thing is you know doing that service design stepping back um thinking about how your workforce and users are going to interact with those you know digital business services um and, and actually i think it's probably the most fundamental and foundational step and the other part of it for me is most from the bottom up you know essentially retaking really and thinking about the data assets that you're going to need therefore to enable that and, and, and let me be clear, thinking about those as assets, curating them as assets, investing them in, in them, and thinking about how you get value from those assets, whether in your own organization or through, as Keegan was saying earlier, working with others and enriching them with data that you might be able to bring together from across the wider kind of public sector ecosystem. Good. Just to re-echo one point, because I think it's fundamental to all of this, which is that this is an opportunity to rethink how you do things. And AI will probably force you to sort of transform your internal business processes in order to you know, fully leverage it. Mm. The idea that you can do things the exact same as you're doing, but now you do them digitally, don't do this. This is bad. Mm -hmm. uh, as a general rule, it, it's you don't necessarily want to just be doing the same thing, but now digital, you should be thinking about how can, you can do these things better, how you can get remove some of these roadblocks and how digital technologies and data-driven sort of uh, business tools and AI can help you to sort of, you know, get around these existing roadblocks and, you know, try to make the organization more effective and more efficient. Right, good. Um, a reality is that AI is here today and be implemented ad hoc. What's the best practice to put it in place now and how? So um, I think I think for me it depends a little bit on uh, the context in which you're deploying AI and the way you've gone about procuring it and how it, you know how it's being being deployed. You know, so as I was saying earlier, things like those kind of co-pilot tools, these sorts of things, um, require a different really sort of set of thinking and, and kind of governance around them, a different order of governance than you know a, a tool that's going to be making or supporting clinical decisions naturally. So I think um, I, you know. I think anything I say just now might be slightly oversimplifying things, and, and I don't want to oversimplify uh, what is a complex area. What is worth having a really good look at is the uh, the AI playbook that the Scottish Government has put together. So that kind of brings together a whole set of best practice from you know, the full kind of, um, kind of life cycle, if you like, kind of data-driven technologies and solutions and how we might think about, well, first of all, um, ideating them, but then you know, designing, developing, deploying, managing, and, and indeed retiring them. So um, that's probably the, a, a really good resource to kind of think through some of those issues, Fraser. Great, good. Albert, I'm aware you had need to leave. So thank you very much for attending today. It's been great and give us a lot of good information. So Awesome. Thanks for having me. Sorry great, for thank you. Off. Cheers. Thanks. Thanks, uh, you. Cheers. Keegan, so um, so it's just yourself now. So well, that's okay. Uh, how will government and others be able to share data within GDPR rules? So I will uh, I'll actually pick up with the, the question that was asked before. Sorry. Uh, I, no, no, no it's, it's okay, but I will get to this one. Uh, one thing that I, I want to say is that this is absolutely a really important point because people are already using ChatGPT, even if they're not supposed to, people are using GitHub Copilot. Uh, so it's just really you know, necessary to understand 
one, how people are using it in your organization uh, and sort of developing some initial baseline guidance uh, at the moment, either internally or drawing from resources that are already available, uh, as we just heard about from sort of AI playbook uh, coming out from, from the Scottish government. So it's important not to ignore this or pretend like it isn't happening uh, at, at, at this level. Um, that That's just what I would comment on that. In terms of the sort of question on GDPR and data sharing, there are examples all across Europe on, on how to sort of build these data exchange and interoperability systems. It's an emerging area of inquiry. So uh, there's a lot of things happening. I would just recommend taking a look at like the European interoperability uh, reference architecture, European interoperability framework, uh, in, funnily enough, like in, in Anglo-Saxon countries. So Australia, uh, US, uh, New Zealand, the UK, there actually happens to be you know a lot of barriers to data exchange due to sort of um uh data privacy and uh, consent and 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 so on so it, it's not necessarily gdpr but these barriers are already in place before gdpr um it's just about uh creating the sort of necessary legal framework to to support this uh, but i'm also not uh you know working in, in the privacy field so much but if anybody's interested in data exchange and interoperability feel free to uh, reach out and email me because I, I have a few papers on this topic that look at how you build these things from a technical perspective and the different regulations that are involved and how they're managed and so on. Good. Um, so a couple more questions to go. We're about to start discovery for a new, no, sorry, we've actually covered up, apologies. <laughs> um, a quick, considering AI is also almost a probability machine, do you think that statistical models such as linear regression will be used to regulate AI developments? So I think one thing to keep in mind is that there's some sort of myth that AI isn't regulated at the moment, but that's not true. Like there are many, for example, uh, I already can't discriminate against people if I work for a public sector organization. It's already illegal for me to, I don't know, walk down the street and hit somebody with a hammer. There are things that exist in law, right, that are already dictating what you can and cannot do. So I similarly can't use AI to sort of, I don't know, enact harm on somebody for no reason or to discriminate against them and, and so on and so forth. So the real question is, you know, how can we empower the sort of regulators who already have the responsibility to regulate some of these things, uh, you know, now as AI becomes increasingly sort of used uh, in, in the wild? Absolutely, technical tools will be sort of part of this. Um, and you're starting to see some initiatives looking into to what that might look like, it's going to be probably more advanced than you know a regression or something like that. But uh, it will be some sort of combination of, I, even now in like the, the US, I know scale AI is doing something related to um, creating a platform to help sort of uh, look at how these systems might be biased and regulated and, and, and so on. So there's, there's stuff happening in this space. Good, that's great. Um... So I'm just last, sort of last question. Um, what measures can be put in place to prevent bias and discrimination with AI? Yeah, I think that this is once again, at least uh, it's, it's sort of a multi-step process or multi-step uh, initiative in the sense that it's it's from, from the ground up, you need to understand the data that's being used. You need to have the sort of transparency throughout the process, having documentation about why certain decisions were made. Uh, you know, having sort of strong version control in place so that you can see how different versions of the model that you might be using might be leading to different outcomes, uh, how you can enforce this with uh, procurement, uh, how you can, there's a great paper that queried something like 40 different municipalities in the US about AI systems that they were using. And I think like, you know, four or five of them actually had any documentation about how they worked. So stuff like this, you know, understanding, having the paperwork requiring this sort of stuff will go a long way. Um, in, in boosting these things, but also having accountability and trying to do some testing uh, before to make sure that these, you know, systems um, are not being unnecessarily biased or, or unequal or unethical. Good. So there's another question coming out just related to actually what you mentioned there. So um, regarding the procurement, um, sorry, what, um, what consideration challenges should organizations um, look at when they're looking at procurement of AI? Yeah, so, so you know, one thing that, that I have seen quite a lot 
uh, when public sector organizations are procuring AI is that they don't actually understand how AI works. And so they write these technical descriptions that are sort of nonsensical or not possible. So it's really important to have the sort of internal capacity to know, one, what data you have, how it can be shared, what you can build, what you can't build. Uh, so it's about sort of building the knowledge and know-how about you know what's possible, what's out there, doing the proper market research, uh, having guidelines in place on how do you write these uh, procurements, um, you know, doing these things like deep data dives, like I, I talked about earlier, so you know what sort of use cases you might be able to do, uh, having the sort of understanding legally about which data you can share, how you can share it, making this available to the people who will be the, you know, doing the procurement. Another fun thing to think about, uh, which is that a lot of AI capacity is locked up in the sort of SME sector mm -hmm. uh, or startups, and they don't necessarily have the capacity to participate in larger procurements uh, or, or in any procurements for that matter. So there's a lot of interesting research going on about how do we sort of move towards either challenge-based procurement or sort of innovative procurement methods that sort of open up the opportunities for people to, to get involved. Um, yeah, so there's the... The procurement in a box, I think, came out with the UK and another organization directly related to AI procurement. There's examples from Estonia about how you do this. There's examples uh, also from at the EU. They're creating new standard clauses for the procurement of AI based on these standard clauses that were built um, and, and put together in Amsterdam. So, so lots of stuff happening in this space. Right. And sort of one more point. Um, somebody is asking for where would they think they'd find the best information to start with AI? Thanks for like an AI playbook example. Uh, yeah, I mean, I put together, for example, with the OECD's Observatory of Public Sector Innovation a couple of years ago, a book called Hello World, Artificial <clears throat> Intelligence in the Public Sector. And this covers everything from the uh, technical foundations of AI through to the sort of institutional requirements, different case studies, uh, you know, what internal capacities you need, infrastructure. It's sort of like a 200 page report that covers a lot of this stuff. Um, otherwise, this element of AI course that I mentioned based out of Finland, I think is free and does a really good job introducing the fundamentals of AI. Uh, there's some really interesting research doing uh, from the JRC out of the EU related to their AI watch project. Uh, you know, they've gathered something like six or 700 use cases of AI in the public sector and, and put together, you know, like what it looks like, who was involved, uh, what the goals were, was it successful, was it not successful? Um, if anybody wants to reach out, feel free to, and I can try to put you and in. And the one in, in Finland, right is that free for anybody that lives in the UK? Or do you... As far as I know, it's for everybody. Um, I might be wrong. I hope I'm not, but uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll pop it in the chat anyway uh, so somebody can share it. But I know also that A Political is putting out a new course on AI soon. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of stuff happening, and I think that's public. I hope it is, but um, yeah. Right, brilliant. That's great. Thanks a lot. So I'd like to say thanks for everybody to, who's joined us today. Our recording will be sent out in the next couple of days. And also like to say a big thanks to yourself, Keegan, and obviously Albert, um, who's dropped off. But you've made some excellent points. I think certainly I've learned a lot today. I think it's been great. And you've obviously sold the benefits of AI and where it's going rather than a lot of the fear mongering that's going on. So thank you very much and enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Right. Cheers. Thank you very much. Cheers.